State fairs, they're the perfect place to locate and consume insane, over-the-top, it just won't end, wild food creations you'll never find anywhere else. Oh, mm -hmm. In this extended video, we're taking you to the two biggest, most iconic state fairs in the USA, the Minnesota State Fair and the State Fair of Texas. I'm on a mission to show you the 50 most unique, crave-worthy foods you must try in this lifetime. It all starts here in Minnesota, where some mega food factories are churning out tasty treats on a massive scale. Sir, yeah, put her there. This is our first stop, first day. There are hundreds of vendors here, but we're looking for the vendors who are putting out thousands and thousands of pounds of food. And I notice you guys are doing just that. Welcome to Fresh French Fries. Founded in 1973, they slowly grew from a small stand to the French fry factory you see today. Leading this massive operation, Bill Wozniak. Tell me about what you're serving here. These are chipper potatoes. What's a chipper potato? Chippers, a potato that has an ideal mix of starch and sugar that, according to this stand, make a perfect French fry. How much product you're putting out in a good year? Good year for us, which 2019 was a wonderful year. We did about 460,000 pounds of potatoes. 460,000 pounds? Yeah. That's more than like a shipping container? Oh, yeah. You know, typically, we're selling around about 100,000 units. In the whole fair? Yeah, or more. Mm. First, a sack of potatoes is dumped into a receptacle. What is that? This yeah. machine behind me. Then they're conveyor belted up until they plop into the peeler. It's a belt fed conveyor system that has a very particular amount of potatoes that it feeds for our drum peeler behind you. The peeler is lined with sandpaper. A powerful stream of water tumbles the potatoes about until the skins are all removed. Does it turn them into fries too? Yeah, right here. Now they're manually moved to the cutter. What is the perfect width for a french fry? Taking this big bulbous beauty and instantly smashing it into uniform starch rods. We're looking for crispier exterior and kind of a baked potato inside. So we're kind of looking for that centimeter-ish range. Centimeter, yeah, that's very that's European. Right. The raw fries are loaded into the frying basket. First, they get fried in hot oil. That cooks them through evenly. Then they're moved to even hotter oil, which gives the fries a crispy, crunchy exterior. Finally, the hottest oil of them all ensures the crunch lasts as long as possible. We end up having them drained, and then they're dumped right behind you, and then lightly dusted with salt or vinegar or ketchup. Amazingly, these chippers go from a whole potato to salty, crunchy french fries in just a few minutes. All right, so the fair, it's bustling, it's wild, it's crazy. The best part about the fair is there are hundreds of food locations and everybody is taking turns going to this stall and that stall. You don't want to blow your whole empty stomach at one place. Now, even though I've said that, I have purchased the largest French fry that you can get here at this particular vendor. This behemoth of a bucket right here costs $14. Good thing I memorized that earlier. They're hot, they're steamy. It's like I have a nebulizer full of French fry scent. Hold on, pull up a picture of a nebulizer. No, not that one. Pull up a nebulizer on a horse. Yes, like that. I feel like a horse with a nebulizer that's full of french fry scent. It's very specific, I know. The moment of truth. Beautiful french fry. It's greasy, it's hot, it's burning my fingers a little bit. Let's try it out. Mmm. Oh, that's very satisfying. So just a little bit of crunch on the outside. There's just a little bit of salt on there, and it's just so much different from like a McDonald's french fry. That would be much thinner, more crunchy, but it wouldn't have this really satisfying, mashy, steamy, starchy center like this has. I gotta try some ketchup. I'm gonna get a triple fry. It's more surface area. It's gonna really grab onto this ketchup. Look at that. It's like a torch in the night. Let's try it out. Mm-hmm. Now, I would recommend don't start with the ketchup because then you're going to be giving your palate a little too much razzle-dazzle. Start plain, just the potato, just the salt, and then when your palate grows weary, you can add some ketchup. This today is my breakfast. We're just getting started. We have a lot more to see. Let's keep moving. Every year, just 300 food vendors feed millions of state fair attendees with a total of 500 carefully curated menu items, all approved by the fair board. Competition to get into the fair is fierce. Potential vendors know that in just 12 days here, you could make a small fortune. Next up, we're meeting a state fair food boss with a menu item so outrageous, it took five years to be approved. Brad, give me a handshake. I'm very excited. This interview is going to be rated C because it's about to get cornographic. Are you into cornography? Uh. 
Brad Rebar grew up with the Minnesota State Fair, where his family ran a sanitation business for over 68 years. Brad got the idea for selling corn from another fair in nearby Wisconsin. I tried it for the first time. I've never seen roasted corn in my life. I took a bite, turned around, bought another one. It's so good. But before he could turn this idea into a dream business, he had a lot of convincing to do. Everybody told me nobody's going to buy sweet corn. It won't sell. And it took five years for the fair to approve the idea. Wow. To approve corn. They're like, listen, guys, this guy has a radical idea corn and that took five years to approve. There are 12,000 different species of corn in the world and that's not counting deep sea underwater corn. Ah! But Minnesota is well known for its sweet corn. Very tender, very sweet. This seed actually comes from Japan. Oh really? Yeah. Although the seeds flew in from Japan, this corn was grown here in Minnesota, specifically for this event. I'm curious how much you sell in a good year. Yeah. You can measure it however you want. Like bathtub fulls is what I usually use for measurements. You want to put it that way, we're probably doing 600 bathtubs a night. Wow, that's a lot of bathtubs of corn. <laughs> First, they take the refrigerated sweet corn and slide it down to the soaking tub. We try to keep the corn refrigerated first to keep the starch from building up. Here, it soaks for 10 to 15 minutes before it moves to the grill. We get real busy, it might not hit the water very long. This custom-made gas grill was built specifically for this operation, ensuring a nice, even heat and pinpoint caramelization. I don't think I've ever had a well-roasted, really like caramelized piece of sweet corn, so I definitely want to try that today. Add water to steam the corn, or maybe they're just doing that for the cameras. I'm not sure. Once cooked, husk it and dip it in a vat of melted butter. Is it salted or unsalted? Salted butter. Salted butter. The seasoning is up to you. Brad, thank you so much. I'm so pumped to try your corn. I've tried a lot of different corn, but I've never had this type of sweet corn in Minnesota from Japan. Okay. Let's see. Enough of the interview, enough of the story. I finally have this big, thick piece of corn in my hands right now. On one side, it's kind of rare. On the other side, it's a more medium well. So you have a variety of textures and flavors here. And he said it actually caramelizes the sugars inside. So that should create a really new, unique type of taste. I'm gonna go for it. I don't, where do you start? Do you start corn in the middle, on the side? Do you, do you eat it like this? Yeah, you eat it like that. I don't think she's giving me the right advice. All right, let's give it a shot. Oh, mmm, that's some good corn. It's so delicious. It's salty, it's peppery, and it's just buttery enough. The thing with sweet corn is it has a lot of flavor already. You don't want to overdo the butter. I've seen people who have destroyed their palates through years of junk food abuse. It needs to be literally half butter for them to enjoy it, but here, they just give it a little bit of a dip. Not a lot of bit of a dip, just a little bit of a dip. Mm. Brad, not Bradley, inside he told me I was gonna have a corngasm and I think he, uh, he's right. This video is now demonetized. The Minnesota State Fair started in 1854 with a mission to promote the state's agriculture. At first, the fair's location changed every year, but in 1885, it found its permanent location right here where we are today. It wasn't until 1989 when the fair got its first giant bird leg vendor. Meet Cheryl. Cheryl, can I have a handshake? Cheryl and her husband have sold turkey legs all over the USA. We do this fair, we do the South Carolina State Fair, the Florida State Fair, and the Florida Strawberry Fair. Oh, that's a lot of traveling. But in order to roast up this beautiful turkey leg bounty, they had to go mobile. This turkey mobile drives from here to Florida. When it's parked up and ready, this roaming rotisserie can roast up to 700 legs at once. That's my kind of food truck. How much does it cost for one? It costs $15. That seems very reasonable. It's huge, it's protein packed, it's a lot of food. Do you see people trying to go at this by themselves or are they sharing it among a small community of people? A lot of times a family will come up with five and they might order three to five. If you look at them out there, there's nothing left on the bone. Usually, the only time you'll see a turkey leg whole is Thanksgiving. How many of these are you selling during the whole Minnesota State Fair? And in that case, you gotta share it with your already buzzed up Uncle Sonny. We usually bring a semi-load in. What is it, Mike? Eight or nine hundred? Here, it's just you and this Flintstone-sized bird leg, a fair snack that became popular at Disney. We use the same turkey leg that Disney World does. So this is the exact same turkey leg from the exact same company in Tampa, Florida. So it's already cooked when you get it. Exactly. Why do you choose to do it that way and have you always done it that way? I've just not found that the raw turkey leg is as good of a tasting turkey leg. Are you talking about eating a turkey leg raw? The process starts with their pre-smoked turkey legs. These plus-sized thighs roast in the turkey trailer for one to two hours. 
you go through 200 cases in a day, you don't have time to cook them raw. Then they're moved to the grill to crisp up the skin. And the raw does not taste like ham. These taste more like ham. Finally, wrap it in tin foil to keep it hot and serve. Today I've basically been eating like a vegetarian. French fries, corn, but now it's time for some meat. Here, look at this. A big, beautiful turkey leg all nestled up in swaddling clothes like the baby turkey Jesus. I think they put tin foil on there to help preserve the heat. We're gonna slowly peel that back like a beautiful, meaty banana. Yes, this is a giant leg. This must have been one beast of a bird. Ooh, it smells good. It smells smoky, fatty, greasy. Let's go for it. It's so hot, it's so juicy, it just slides right down. It's oily, it's fatty, but it actually has more of a hammy taste to it than a turkey taste. I'm not sure why a hammy flavor is so desired, but I think that's what happens when you smoke the meat. It just gives it more of a cured kind of flavor to it. Oh, yes. Now this is just a pure skin shot right here. Okay, I'm gonna pop that back. Oh, it's just a whole different texture, a whole different flavor, very desirable. That's what you want. All right, so right here, guys, this part of the turkey leg is like a release valve. I'm gonna pull that back. Yes, bingo! Look at the inside of this, that looks so good. I feel like I've been eating for 10 minutes now and I'm not even halfway done with it. This is a great value. And to imagine, they're selling a literal truckload of this every year here at the State Fair. Incredible. Every new vendor at this fair hopes to become the next Martha a Minnesota State Fair icon who turned a simple recipe into a million dollar business just by selling cookies. Martha? Yes. Put her there. Okay. Meet the queen of this cookie dough kingdom, Sweet Martha. She and her business partners started with a tiny cookie stand. Over 40 years, she built it into a cookie empire. It's all just one thing on the menu, right? That's right. And that's genius about what you do here because <laughs> a lot of people might think, oh, I should have six or seven really good things, or you take one thing and really perfect it and make a lot of it. Absolutely. So for you, in a really good year, like 2019, yes. do you know about how many cookies you sold? In 2019, we probably sold at least about 3 million cookies a day. Their super secret cookie recipe is an amalgam of several mother's recipes. They've got the same great taste from day one, but over time, small adjustments were made to the recipe, so it's better suited to cooking at such a large scale. Let's talk about the recipe. Could you write it down exactly for me? Well, I would not do that, no. Oh, okay, that's fine. <laughs> Martha's cookies start with their secret dry mix. What is more secret, the ingredients or the ratio? Then add shortening and water. Probably both. Probably both, okay, I'm gonna guess. When the mixture is combined, it's time for the chocolate chips. Flour. Yeah, there's flour in Pickle there. juice. No, I don't no, think I'm so. No, I'm already messing yeah. it up. All this goes into a dolloping machine, which portions this giant glob of cookie dough into perfect cookie-sized chunks and spreads them on a baking tray. The chunks are manually spread out to create enough space for each cookie. When the tray is ready, it's placed on a cooking rack. This whole rack goes into the oven for 10 to 12 minutes, depending on the weather. Basically, we have all open windows around here, so mm. we're sort of working outside. So the humidity could affect the cookies. Exactly. When the cookies come out of the oven, they're still too gooey to eat. They need a quick rest before they're served in a cone or a bucket. Is it still gonna be warm when I bite into it? Yes, that's what we time. Piled high and served to eager crowds who might only get to try this treat once a year. All over the fair, you can see people walking around with these buckets and alas, it is my turn to try it out. Martha, thank you so much. So nice to talk to you. Our final meal of the day, you have to end with something sweet. Even though you eat a bunch of savory, rich foods, you always have room for dessert. This is a lot of dessert. This whole thing is four dozen cookies. And you're like, cool, thanks for the math problem. So that's approximately 48. Boom, nailed it. Take that, Mr. Johnson. Oh, they're so nice. When you grab onto it, you can feel that the edges are just more crispy. They've bubbled up more and it's doughy in the middle. Oh, the edge, the edge is gonna be crispy. Mmm. Oh, it's so satisfying. Great texture, great crunchiness on the outside. Then as you get to the inside, doughy, soft. And the middle just melts on your tongue. The only thing I'm missing right now is some milk. Let me get some milk. Hi, now I have milk. Take the cookie, give it a little bit of a dip. Oh, 
Oh my God. Santa Claus would murder a child for this. It's that good. I love it. Calvin Sunny. Welcome to the Minnesota State Fair. Thank you. <laughs> Today, it's all about the bizarre, strange food combinations that sound insane. I'm talking weird, unique flavor combinations that should not exist. And in fact, some of them are an abomination to our Lord and Savior. I didn't sign up for that. But what if I told you it's all free? I'm down. Really? Yeah, of course. I mean, free is my middle name. Let's do it. Let's do it. Bizarre foods at the Minnesota State Fair. Let's go. And then you walk that way. Classic comedy duo. The Blue Barn. It was first established in 2014. The menu, food that adds a twist to Minnesota classics. Stephanie? Co-owner Stephanie has been here from the beginning. People think I don't have friends, but I think, I mean, Calvin hangs out with me voluntarily. Hey, friends are good. This barn boasts a huge kitchen and staff with great looking headwear. How hard is it to find a spot here at the State Fair? Okay, so I tried for nine years. Wow. And get financing for a building that you own, but you really can't take with you. Yeah, you can't do anything with it except for two weeks a year. They're all about comfort food that's shareable, easy to eat, and addictive. But just because they have a great food invention doesn't always mean they get to add it to their menu. You have to put everything goes through a review process with the fair. Oh. Once they approve it, it's embargoed until food release day. This year you have a brand new item. Yep. We're here for, what is the full name? The Buffalo Chicken Doskit. Okay, now what the heck is a doskit? It's... This recipe starts with buttermilk biscuit mix. It has buffalo, chicken, it has dough, it has skin. No buffaloes were harmed in this. Oh, no buffalo. Oh. None. I got him a vegan. <laughs> he doesn't eat buffalo, but he will eat chicken. I will. Then add buffalo sauce, diced chicken, and mix. Scoop that mixture to form balls. Then deep fry the dough. This ingredient mixed with this shape, it's not a donut, it's not a biscuit, it's a dough skin. We take a vanilla icing, lace it with Frank's Red Hot to give it that buffalo. Sweet frosting, frosting mixed like with it. buffalo yeah. wing sauce. A little sassy. Finish it off with sprinkled bacon bits, panko breadcrumbs, and chopped parsley. This is a Frankenstein of a concoction. I was expecting a donut that looked like a donut, but here, it's almost like they pre-chewed it for you. Here's just some little bites. You don't even have to chew that one. <laughs> Cheers. Mmm. -hmm. Well, hey man, I like the texture of the biscuit because it's nice and kind of hard and crunchy on the outside, a little bit softer on the inside. Then I'm eating the sauce over here and I'm like, wait, is this a frosting sauce with buffalo or a buffalo sauce with a little bit of frosting? It is more on the sweeter side. The chicken is folded inside, but I don't really see much of the chicken in the dish. I mean, if you put a gun to my head, or an AK-47, rocket launcher, I mean, even a big machete. What about a water gun? Water gun wouldn't do it. Okay. If you put any kind of lethal device next to my head and said, hey, do you taste chicken? I would say, can you not put that by my head? <laughs> and then I would say, no. I don't yeah. taste chicken. I love her creativity. I love that she took something that no one else is gonna do. No. It's really interesting that this has to be approved by a board. It's a buffalo chicken biscandwich. Bistonut. Bit. Um, don't. 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 Don't skit. Don't skit. Ha, ha. Is this gonna make it to next year? We'll have to wait around to find out. I'm gonna ask her POS and her accountants. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Like Blue Barn, other adventurous vendors attempt to push the envelope with twisted food innovations. Michelle. Hey, nice to see you guys. This includes Michelle from Andy's Grill. Quick question, Andy's Grill. How do I know when to add an E to the word grill and when not to? We just thought we'd get creative because it kind of covered more of the sign. Oh. oh, yeah, it's very symmetrical now. Yeah. This place goes back to 1987, a family business that's famous for food that's everything Philly. So I've noticed the strategy around the fair is different for everybody. I saw a guy selling corn and only corn. How many different menu items do you have here? You no, know, we have probably about 12. 12 is already a lot. This year we added our waffle burger. That's kind of a new twist oh. to a hamburger. Imagine how you'd make a normal bacon cheeseburger. Well, this is kind of like that. On the flat top, they cook up beef patties, cheese and bacon together. Here's where it gets wild. Instead of buns, and stay with me here, they use waffles. Waffles infused with maple syrup and crunchy pearl candy. This year, it's all about the waffle burger, but we need something to wash it down with. I've heard that people travel from near and far, but mostly from near, to get this special beer you have. Can you tell me about this beer? It's the chocolate chip cookie beer. It's to die for. It's an amber beer that's infused with chocolate, vanilla, and it's rimmed with 100% chocolate. Is it like drinking a cookie? It has a little bit of a taste like that. She sold me. Yeah, I love beer, but we can pretend it's a cookie for the show. Yes, that's absolutely. Right. It is still before morning, 11.59. If we drink the beers right now, it'll be breakfast beers. It's really more of a dessert beer, but let's go for it. 
What? I've never had chocolate sprinkles on my beer before in my life. Yeah, how do you feel about it? I feel like it's a nice thought. I think it's cool to have chocolate and, and sugar with your beers. It's a nice thought, like when someone gets you a pecan pie for your birthday, but you're allergic to, to nuts. <laughs> We've got syrup on the side, but I think first we should just try to dig in with a bite. It's gonna be tough to get a big bite. I have a small mouth. You gotta go even smaller than this. Oh, mm, the waffle is quite sweet. It's candied. Yeah. Inside the waffle, you can feel little candied crunchy bits breaking apart. This reminds me of a breakfast burger. Like a McGriddle. A McGriddle. Another bite? Do I have to? That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like it. Are you starting to throw a route? Yes. Yeah. Let's dip that and see how it is. We got some syrup in here. The move is going to dip, and then you want to pull it up so that it drops right back into the burger. This is the whole sweet and savory. I'm trying to explain the food right now. Mm. This is the whole sweet and savory Minnesota Fair type food. And it's inventive, mm -hmm. and it's bizarre. Are you, are you trying to not take a bite? <laughs> <laughs> This bizarre breakdown continues at Dino's Euro. They specialize in all types of Euros, a popular street food in Greece. But this year, they've decided to cross over with a taste of Italy. I just got back from Dino's Euros and I got an order of a Greek food that you might not expect. What is this actually? Well, first of all, are you familiar with a Euro? Do you mean gyro? I meant gyro. Then I, yes, I am. Imagine a gyro with all the delicious shaved lamb and fresh cream tomato feta cheese. Feta cheese. Take that. Throw it in a blender and put it in a ravioli. But a ravioli isn't Greek. Exactly. Ravioli. It's pasta stuffed with something delicious like meat, cheese, or hopefully both. Here, these mad food scientists have put all the ingredients from a Greek gyro, including this delicious roasted and seasoned gyro meat, and they've shoved it into this Italian ravioli shell with a roasted garlic dressing. I've had ravioli many times before, but that comes from a can. There's also another way to make it, which is boiling. But there's actually a third way to make it. That is actually frying the ravioli. Now, are we at the fair or are we not at the fair? We are at the fair. We gotta fry some stuff. I can't wait to try this out. It's a one biter. Ooh, you're gonna try to do one bite? Yeah, maybe. I'm gonna take two bites. Cause your mouth is so small. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. It's so zesty. Mm. The first thing you taste is the sauce on the outside. It's garlicky, it's rich. That fried texture of the ravioli is so different because I love a boiled ravioli. It's so fun to chew through almost like a doughy, al dente ravioli. I like how they combined all the ingredients inside. It's the whole euro and made into bite-sized walkable pieces. Oh, walkable. You can take it on a ride, take it in a photo booth. You can take it into the little animal area, secretly feed it to an alpaca. But you can't take it swimming. <laughs> <laughs> now for a food combination that'll really make you question your existence. I just grew up in this state and I assumed everything I ate was pretty normal. And then you saw this food and you said you'd never seen this before. What is this? It's called a pickle dog. It comes from the stand right behind us. This place is called Pickle Dog. Since 1989, this family-run business has been bringing smiles to patrons' faces. This is something you might actually see at a party in Minnesota. You know, people here might make some deviled eggs and bring that to a party. I like that. Like a hors d'oeuvre. Or d'oeuvre. Is it singular? There is an S, but the S is silent. Or d'oeuvre. Uh, you went to French cooking school, right? Yes. Tradition has it that a pickle dog should contain cream cheese, pickle, and ham. But here, they make it with seasoned, smoked pastrami. Pickle! Oh. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh, it's so good! You love it for real? I love it! I want to know why. I'm too familiar with it. I can't break it down. The crunch of the pickle with the creaminess of the cream cheese and then wrapped in pastrami, that is better than any hush puppy. That is better than any pigs in a blanket. That is better than any meatloaf on a stick. I gotta say the pastrami is a huge level up. It has a pepperiness to it. They don't make pastrami in Asia. <laughs> For this bizarre masterpiece, it's $8. Honestly, it's a lot of money. <laughs> Pastrami's not cheap though. I really like it. No, honestly, this is one of the dishes that we had on the Bizarre episode that I really am down with. This is food number four. We still have two insane locations to go to. Let's go now. heard of tachos? It's basically nachos, but instead of tortilla chips, you're using tater tots and you are happy about it. Here at Snack House, they take it a step further with a new bizarre blend in a recipe they call Memphis Tachos. I'm told it's inspired by Elvis Presley himself. He reportedly loved bananas and peanut butter. And bacon. And 
Now, see, I think that we do not know for sure. Oh. I did five seconds of research. Hold on. Presley's fondness for peanut butter and banana sandwiches is well established. However, bacon is not mentioned at all in accounts. Well, then. These tachos took inspiration from the classic but still weird peanut butter banana bacon sandwich. They're skipping the cheese and layering in bacon, sliced bananas, and finally, a peanut butter sauce. This is something altogether different. Also, there's a tractor in the background. So, I mean, if that's not production value, I don't know what is. How much is enough for you guys? When will it be enough? They don't always have peanut sauce in Vietnam, but if I get peanut sauce with my spring roll, I am like double dunking it in there. I'm a peanut sauce fiend. A peanut sauce lover. A yeah, peanut. You just really emphasize the tea, please. Peanut. Lover. Yeah. This is a banana with some peanut butter sauce. Warm. Peanutty. Banana y. Mm -hmm. Next, the tater tot. Salty, creamy, delicious. I did not expect the peanut butter to go well with a tater tot, but it goes really well. And these are great tots. If Elvis was here today, he would be proud. He would shed a tear and maybe even write a song about this very food. Ain't nothing but a tater dog. Don't sing it too much. Okay, well, I can sing, but if I become too melodic, we'll get defunded. We got everything here. The perfect bite. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's try it out. Mmm. That's delicious. There's something about this that, that is kind of off-putting for me. Really? What would you give it out of 10? Be honest, because I like it. A three out of 10? A three out of 10. Wow. Yeah. I would love to have tachos with nacho cheese, chili con carne, jalapeno, sour cream, all that good stuff. It's so cliche. I know. You're a traditionalist. No. No. But <laughs> in this situation, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. It's my good friend, Calvin. Hello. Hello, guys. Meet Stina and Luis. She's the co-founder, and he's the corporate chef of Nordic Waffles. Their products are being sold across 10 states in the USA. It all started here in Minnesota about six years ago. First of all, you come from a pretty different places, right? I mean, you're originally from Mexico. Yes, from Mexico. Originally from Norway. Uh -huh. And then you met in Minnesota? Yes. yes. Stina earned herself the title of Waffle Queen in Norway, but she decided to move here, where she could introduce her traditional heart-shaped waffles. Waffles in Norway is a big tradition, and it's also, you know, how kids in America make lemonade. That's what kids in Norway do too. They start selling their waffles and their little... A little waffle stand. Yeah. I love that. If you do that here, you will be arrested by the police if you do not have a permit. Eventually, she met Luis, and together, they're making waffle magic. Here, they offer waffle toppings you won't find in Norway or anywhere else for that matter. Breakfast waffles, a s'mores waffle, even a smoked salmon waffle. With my vision of creating a revolution with waffles, which we in Nordic Waffles call the Waffolution, it became a little hard uh. to stay in Norway and do this because people wouldn't try it and they wouldn't eat it. There is a culture. If you stand out or if you do something wild, you become somebody. You should hide. You shouldn't really show it. Well, look, the USA is pretty much the opposite of that. Yes. Can you talk about some of the standout items on the menu? Chicken and macaroni. Allow me to introduce the chicken and macaroni waffle. It sounds straightforward, but let's go deeper. It starts with the bone-in drumstick, which hangs out in a 24-hour marinade that contains buttermilk, salt, pepper, and secret rotisserie seasoning. How many portions do you sell a day? On average, we're selling about 300 portions. Of that one? Of oh, that one waffle. Oh, yeah, just wow. that one. Then it's rolled in a mixture of flour, cornstarch, and deep fried. I've had chicken and waffles that has a bone in, but I've also had tender styles. I think we'll figure it out. I can find my way around a waffle. Or a bone. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Next, the warm, soft, freshly made waffle is piled with mac and cheese. Then the chicken drummy, a bit of seasoning, honey, and finally, scallions. Calvin, we've reached our final location. One of the most delicious things I've seen at the fair so far. I think we just go for it. I'm gonna just take a bite of chicken. Chicken, yes. and then chase it with a macaroni waffle oh. chaser. Mmm. 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 Oh my god. What a combination. It is so crunchy. And then it's just a nice, meaty, juicy, dark meat. I like how he used the bone-in drumstick. It gets you more involved in the action. And then that glaze, that honey. It's just, when you're at a place like this, where you're eating non-stop, highly decadent foods, you need that extra hit of sweetness to get your brain buzzing. Usually, I'm not a big fan of carbs on carbs. Right but here, it's carb, protein, carb. So the chicken's almost surrounded by this carb heaven. This is our final food. The only thing left to do now is to decide which one was the most bizarre. Calvin, today we tried six different bizarre fair foods. Which, to you, was the most unique? The most unique out of all six today had to have been 
the Nordic waffle. Really? Yes. Even though the flavors are common, I think how they did it was truly unique. Calvin, I do agree. That is an awesome food, but for me, the most unique food, the most ballsy take on a menu item had to be the Memphis Tachos. Ooh. Tater tots, peanut butter, bananas, bacon. It seems like it shouldn't work. For you, it didn't work. For me, it worked just fine. Well, Sonny, the Minnesota State Fair taught me one thing. What? You can put anything in a boat and it'll be delicious. And sell it for $20. <laughs> Today, it's all about crazy food creations on a stick. The Minnesota State Fair is famous for putting food on a stick. I don't know when this became a trend, but it did. This year, vendors proudly boast over 80 different foods on a stick. They've gone crazy with the stick theme. Here, you can even find a pork chop on a stick, cheese on a stick, spaghetti on a stick. How do you put spaghetti on a stick? We will find out soon enough, Sonny. Now, it's time for Calvin and I to hit the streets. You ready? What does that do? Expands your large intestines and small intestines. Should we go? Yeah, okay. Calvin, this is our first location of the day, and this is a perfect breakfast because it's bacon. The love Big Fat Bacon has built over the last 15 years can all be attributed to one product, a big fat quarter pound piece of bacon on a stick. During 12 glorious days each year, Big Fat Bacon treats its patrons with these specially baked on a stick thick cuts. 25 minutes in the oven, followed by two minutes on the flat top, turns the crispiness to 11.5. Finally, a shiny glaze of maple syrup and a sprinkle of peppercorn and sea salt. This thing is gigantic. Yeah, I think two people usually split it in half and they eat their way to the center at the same time and it usually ends with a romantic kiss. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? That we both eat our own? Exactly. Aha. Uh -huh. That's so satisfying. That is a thick cut bacon, but you still got some crispy bits in there. So it has a nice outer rind of fat, but it's not overpowering. It has a nice fat to meat ratio. Hey, you have a nice fat to meat ratio too. I do, don't I? Maple flavor goes perfect for breakfast. It's oily, it's greasy, it's sticky. There's one thing we're missing. Reaching off screen. <laughs> it's chocolate. Give me, give me, give me, give me that swing. Give me that swing. Boop. Are you? Is this the day to be cautious? What's happening? Let's bring it, right? Bring it. Bring the 11. Give me, give me, give me, give me. Yeah, good. Kevin does not have confidence in this concept, but I do. Let's go for it. Hmm. Mm, mm, mm. One more? It's a great contrast between the savoriness and the oiliness of the bacon. And now this sweet, rich chocolate sauce. Bacon, pork go so well with sugar. Oh, please, I don't want to be. Oh, because I'm a pig? The corn dog is inarguably the most iconic food on a stick in the USA. And in 1947, it became the first food on a stick introduced to this state fair. 365,000. That is the average number of corn dogs consumed here each year. But why go for an old school dog when you could have a mega dog? When I first saw this, I was wondering where the heck do you get an 18 inch sausage? What they actually do, multiple dogs, oh one, two, three, God. on top of each other. The dogs are concealed with a thick layer of cornmeal batter, then immersed in bubbling oil. Fry until it's golden. Oh, oh, that's so hot. But it's so delicious. A nice plump wiener inside. Beautiful, bready, crispy, crunchy corn dog shell on the outside. Yes, the cornmeal is sweet. has a nice exterior where it's crunchy. And the color on it, that is really good golden fry. The shop behind us has been serving these since 1954. Corn dogs, yummy, yummy. This one is their longest variation. But there's a dilemma coming up. The stick, what do you keep doing? At some point, it's going to go through me, Calvin. I'll be a new co-host. <laughs> oh, I know your plan now. That I die and you take over the show. I'm the taking you out of my will immediately. <laughs> Why did I just say, in the event that I die, Calvin takes over the best ever food review show. I'm taking that clause out. You get my shoe collection instead. The state fair is packed with edible nostalgia, but it's also a field for creativity and innovation. The Blue Barn is a sturdy player on that field. For eight years, this building has been a reliable destination for good old comfort food. And their best seller happens to be on a stick. Here we have Nashville chicken 
on a stick. Have you ever had a Nashville hot chicken before? It's the, all the craze right now. Really? Yes. Tell me about it. I don't know anything about it. Okay, voiceover. Nashville hot chicken is fried chicken with a major cake from their cayenne pepper hot sauce. At Blue Barn, they start with chicken breast, marinated in buttermilk, egg, hot sauce, and some secret spices. Once the breasts soak up all those zesty flavors, they're coated with crushed cornflakes. Then on the skewer and in the frying pan. Then it's out for a slather of their signature cayenne blend. This chicken on a stick was first introduced in 2019, and they sold 37,000 portions at the state fair. This year, it might be 37,000 and two. two. Ooh. The cornflakes really give a great texture and crunch. Cornflakes and not just a fine kind of powder on the outside. It creates more surface area. There's more crisp to crunch on. I admire people who choose to work with chicken breast. Out of all the animal parts, it'd be easier to make something delicious and juicy out of pig brain than chicken breast. Chicken breast can be so dry if you treat it wrong. Yeah, but it's been treated really well. Really well. Oh, a bit my mouth. The chicken and a little bit of my mouth in one meal coagulate together becomes this new dish, the sunny Nashville hot chicken. Not bad. We got that recipe. Woo. The Midwest's anything on a stick obsession can be traced back to this guy and his invention from 1927. This machine made frying smooth as grease. Soon, vendors were free to shove sticks in and fry up all manner of foods, including our next Minnesota sweetheart, Hot Dish. Hot Dish is a famous Minnesota recipe. Basically, green beans in a can, corn in a can, some ground beef, cream of mushroom soup, also from a can, mix it all up, top that with tater tots, that's tater tot hot dish here. Hot Dish on a Stick. Invented in 2002, Hot Dish on a Stick is a fascinating deconstruction of a hot dish. A skewer loaded with a meatball, a tater tot, a meatball, and a tater tot. And finally, another meatball. Dip that in cornmeal batter. And when it's ready, you can give it a little bit of a dip in this. This is cream of mushroom soup. Oh, that looks nice. It does smell like a traditional corn dog, but this has a completely different filling. I can't wait. Let's try it out. The childhood right here on a stick. Cream of mushroom soup as a dipping sauce is pretty hilarious. Usually it's ranch, something cool, but this is a war. The next layer is a tater tot. I think I enjoy the tater tot with the cream of mushroom soup. More, more. The tater tot with the corn dog coating. It's a lot of carb on carb action, but it's sweet and delicious. I don't mind it. No. This is food number four on a stick. We're halfway there. Let's keep moving. You keep doing that. I'm gonna pick up our trash and then I'm gonna grab my other trash. Let's go. Picture this, spaghetti, but now, it's on a stick. Ten years ago, Oodles and Noodles made up their minds to defy gravity with this fun fair food. Angel hair pasta and ground beef tie the knot in a ball and settle down on a stick. These meat lollipops are coated in breadcrumb batter. Then, they get the sizzling treatment. I'm starting to see a trend today. Everything is dipped, fried, and... stuck, <laughs> sticked, penetrated. Like true spaghetti, it gets a slather of marinara sauce and a sprinkle of Parmesan cheese. Sunny, what do you call a fake pasta? Uh, I don't know. An impasta. Oh. It smells tomatoey, fresh. We're looking at a tomato layer, a bread layer, and then the meatball layer, which has some noodles inside of it. It's like Inception, the movie. It's like Inception, the meatball. Oh man, that was really good. Everything we've had so far has been that kind of core meal, core meal batter. I like it, but you don't want it 42 times in one day. This is a really different type of breading, and it's almost like you're eating some kind of crust that you would find on a mozzarella stick with like oregano in there, Italian seasoning. So I like the bread. All the flavors here scream Italian. Basil, oregano, garlic, tomato. You know, for all the dishes we've eaten today, this is the most freshest one because they use tomato. This is $5, and you get a real authentic taste of Italy. Maybe not authentic, but authentic for the North. You can't really tell that it has noodles in there, but the texture is nice, not overly meaty. It's kind of a unique filler. The noodles create a very airy texture to the meatball. Instead of having a dense meatball, this is quite light. It is really good. Boom, Italy on a stick, an entire spaghetti meal. This could feed an entire person for half uh, an hour. <laughs> Next, there's an animal in this sausage you'd never find on Old McDonald's farm. Bayou Bob's joined the fair in 1997, offering a taste of the bayou. That's America's Deep South. The guy who served this to us, his name is Dallas. That's his Bob. Here, their menu is simple. Alligator. 
every year, 20,000 pounds of alligator meat go through this kitchen to get deep fried, sauteed, or wrapped up in a sausage. Unlike chicken or beef, most of the meat that comes off a gator comes from its tail. That tail meat gets ground up and mixed with Cajun seasonings, then stuffed in a sausage. Like a Jimmy Dean's breakfast sausage. Beautifully spiced. I love the flavor. Tons and tons of bayou seasoning here. It doesn't go down like a greasy pork or beef dog. It does have more of like a slightly drier chicken feeling. It is a very flavorful meat. It has more protein, but less fat or sodium than chicken. Here's the thing with alligators. They look terrifying. They had a big mouth, big tail. You could totally eat your head in one bite. But when you see them like this, it's like, oh, it's not so scary. It's smiling, look. This next stick food violates the foundational tenets of four religions and seven cults. Oh my god, that's so heavy. Hold on, I need a freaking crane to prop it up. Ugh. So this looks like a corn dog on stereoids. Or Illinois. This is a dilly dog, like a mutated corn dog that's had some surgical enhancements, including pickle implants. Yo, the roast of my beef, the mash to my potato. It all starts with a brat in the center. Now it's time for the pickle. Already that is enough. I would have been like, this is extreme, but yes. let's try it. And then they fried it after that. To make it not keto friendly. But in order for this usually wet dill rod to hold the forthcoming batter, it must be dried a bit by sweating it out in a pickle warmer. Now it's time to fry. This oblong oddity is one of the state fair's top 10 foods. In a good year, they sell over 2,000 per day. That is a lot of dilly dally. Do you want to cross your arms? Oh, no, I don't. Let's, okay. let's yeah, sorry. Oh. I like it. Uh-oh. Gravity is not helping me right now. It's like this pickle lost too much weight and his clothes don't fit anymore. Take it off the stick? Then how is that a stick-themed episode? Back on the stick. The brat has a nice porky flavor. The pickle has a nice briny, acidic flavor. And then that cornmeal batter is sweet. This is the perfect Minnesota State Fair food. Absolutely perfect. <laughs> It's fun, dude. You got like a pickle here and it's like, oh, is that just a pickle? It's like, no, don't forget about me. I'm here too. I live inside the pickle. Hey, guys. What happens if he gets shy? Oh, hey, guys. I gotta get going. I'll talk to you later. This one is fun. Fun with the capital F. <laughs> Finally, after seven foods, it's time for dessert. This is the most decadent, over-the-top, unhealthy food you'll find here or anywhere else. What we're looking at right here is a pinnacle of sweet fried foods on a stick. I've heard about them my whole life, but I was too poor to drive all the way here and pay for admission, even though I grew up an hour away. Very sad story. This here is a Snickers bar. Wrap it in a pancake batter blanket and deep fry. Get up, get up, get up, get up. If that's not enough to make you reach for your insulin, they also douse it with powdered sugar. This is the ultimate guilty pleasure. Oh my god, that is so good! So sweet! So good! I'm going to be this good. How can you guys eat this growing up? Yeah, what was I thinking? The chocolate, the nougat, the peanut, peanuts. And caramel. And caramel. Together, encased in a pancake batter. This, Sunny, this is true gluttony. When you look inside, you can see the sticker has just completely melted down. All the ingredients are mixing and mingling together. And then there's just a little bit of texture, too. You got the crunch when you bite it. Oh, it's about to poop. About to poop? It was coming out the bottom. There's some stuff you see as you walk around the fair where you're like, there's no way that's going to be good. It's just a gimmick. This seems like a gimmick, but when you eat it, it is delicious. This has withstood the test of time. I may never eat another stickers the same way again. Calvin, today we ate eight different foods on a stick. Tell me which one was your favorite. My favorite today has to be chocolate bacon on a stick. Oh. Ooh, the saltiness, the kir, the chocolate really threw me off. But man, the best surprise of the day. My runner up is the Italy meatball spaghetti on a stick. Very creative, very light, and very surprising. But the one that blew me away, the one I've heard about for over a decade, the Snickers that has been fried. It took my heart away, it took my breath away, and actually my heart rate's going up because of probably the insulin dump and <laughs> I'm having a pre-diabetic moment. This is my final day here, but before I can go, I need to try my favorite food. One does not come to the state fair without trying this food. This is something you can't pick up at your grocery store. You can't order it on Amazon, and good luck trying to make it at home. It all starts here. 
There's so much action back here. How many people do you have working right now in this small space? We have probably about 45 people. Have you ever considered yourself overstaffed? Always. Okay. So it's just a matter of having enough people so that it all runs pretty smooth and most importantly, guests are not waiting. Right, if you're overstaffed, you can over deliver. Exactly. This is Dave Cavallero. He could have spent his days voicing trailers or UFC promos, but instead, exactly 20 years ago, he decided to open the mouth trap, giving State Fair patrons a taste of heaven with his deep fried cheese curds. Soon after, this became Minnesota's most irresistible dairy addiction, and I'm here to get my fix. Can we talk about the cheese? Sure. The cheese comes from Wisconsin. How did you decide which vendor in Wisconsin to get your cheese from? I think in the last 20, 25 years, most of of us that are in the cheese curd business have been buying our cheese from Ellsworth Creamery. In America's Dairyland, also known as Wisconsin, the village of Ellsworth is officially Wisconsin's cheese curd capital, thanks to Ellsworth Cooperative Creamery. What began as a humble butter and egg plant now churns out 180,000 pounds of cheese curds every single day. But what the flip is a cheese curd? Cheese curds develop as fresh milk is acidified, coagulated, and heated. These steps separate the liquid, known as whey, and the solvent, which is the curd we're after. The next step is cheddaring, through which the curds are stacked, cut up, pressed together, and stacked again repeatedly. Once the desired texture forms, the curds are cut, salted, boxed, and shipped here to the mouth trap mere hours later. There we go. Oh my gosh. What I love too is the inconsistency of shape because they all create a little bit different texture and a little variation of flavor. Yes, they do. Ooh, here's a good one right here. All right. Huh? Sorry, I just think in a moment. There was no fire. It's so creamy, just such a fresh, wonderful taste. The texture of it, it's like so thick, it's fun to chew through. Yes, it is, yeah. They do a nice job over there at the creamery. These cheese curds are so good, it's almost impossible to imagine them getting any better. But they do, and Dave's gonna tell me how. So you've got the cheese curd, it was driven in a refrigerator truck, it gets to your door, and what do you do? Well, it gets to our door, we put it away about 11 o'clock at night. Our first year, I think we probably brought in 3,500 pounds per night. Now we're bringing in seven to 8,000 pounds. We get here bright and early in the morning, and seven o'clock, we're making the batter. What is the batter made out of? Is it a wheat flour? It's got a wheat flour to it, right. It's got several ingredients that, like I say, it's proprietary. It's a batter that we buy locally here. We mix it with ice cold water. The consistency is very close to a pancake batter. The most important is getting that batter right. And if it is too thick, too thin, too whatever, then it kind of permeates throughout the course of the whole process. I see the people mixing the cheese curds. They're not being quick about it. They're massaging each single cheese curd. How important is that? Really important. We want to make sure that each piece of the cheese is coated. We don't want to do the downward motion, so to speak, because that's just mashing it together. We want to keep it kind of like this. Once we make several batches, the operator generally has it down. Last step, it's coated, it needs to go in the fryer. I don't see any timers here. How do you know when it's done? Actually, by the look of it. The oil is at 400 degrees. We change the oil nightly. We clean the fryers nightly. So we're starting off with fresh oil. We drop them in. You see the little edges kind of brown, and that's when you know they're done. When I think State Fair, I think this right here, cheese curds. $18 for a bucket of cheese curds. This is far too much for one person. I gotta share. Cheese curds, sir? You gotta share them? Sure I gotta share them. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your service. Cheese curds, shareable. Uh, which one do I try? Here's what I love about picking. There's like little ones like this, which are gonna be more crunchy. And then there's big fat ones like this, which are like juicy. Cheese juice, that's my favorite kind of juice. Screw lemonade, screw apple juice, orange juice. No, cheese juice. If you're from outside the U.S., come to Wisconsin. Try the cheese curds. Cheese there is unlike cheese from any other place in the world. I've tried it all, and there's nothing that comes close. The only way to make it better is with what they've done here. Mmm, it bursts in your mouth. It's just a spray of hot cheese goo. Dude, look at these. They're all kind of stuck together like a big clump. That counts as one piece. Here's what's great about the fair. If they mark the calories on every food, this is information you don't want to have. We're trying to have some comfort food. Knowing the calories would make you not so comfortable. 
This is it. This is the pinnacle. We've reached the top. That being said, there are a couple other new cheese creations being flaunted about here at the fair. These are cheese items that might deserve a spotlight, but don't usually get one. Cheese curds get all the attention. They're like the hot chicken high school, except for 18 bucks, I can actually hang out with these. Let's check out some other cheese. On State Fair Day 2, Calvin and I took on bizarre bites, strange food combinations like doskits, an unusual spicy mix between a donut and a biscuit. <laughs> we had a pickle surrounded with cream cheese and a cloak of pastrami. It's so good! And even a Nordic waffle filled with mac and cheese topped with a bone-in drumstick. Oh my god! What a combination! As you can see, folks in the Midwest are quite fond of comfort food that's designed to send you into a deep postprandial coma. But when you wake from your insulin-induced slumber, you may reach out for something new. That's where hot Indian food comes in. Here they serve authentic Indian flavors in formats familiar to locals. And since I'm on a cheese roll today, I'm gonna keep going with this. This is a very interesting international fried cheese sensation. This is paneer pakora. Paneer pakora. It's a popular batter fried cheese snack originating in Northern India. I've been to India many times. They love cheese, but they eat a really different type of cheese. Their cheese, in this case, is called paneer. This soft, milky cheese is an essential ingredient in many renowned Indian dishes like palak paneer, in which the paneer is simmered in a spinach curry. Oh, it's so good. Wow. Paneer cheese is made from cow or buffalo milk. It's curdled, kneaded, and cut into yummy, nutritious, creamy cubes. But this isn't even the paneer's final form. Imagine cottage cheese, how that's kind of fun to chew on. Now imagine that in a cube form. They take that cube, they put their own signature masala on there, they give it a little bit of a dip in a batter, they fry it, and here it is. Indian cheese curds. What? Sounds pretty unique to me. On the side, we've got a sauce. We'll talk about that later. One step at a time. Boom. Bite number one. I'm going for it. I want it to be good. Is it going to be good? Let's see. Oh, I like that. Delicious Indian spices, similar to like a curry. Cheese curds, they melt. The paneer, it doesn't melt. So even though it heats up, it doesn't really change its physical state. It just becomes like a hotter version of the cube that it is. On the outside, it's nice and crunchy. It really matches the fair theme. Everything being fried and in oil. Now, the sauce. This is a butter chicken sauce. But for some reason, in Minnesota, they've decided to call it tomato butter. Something I'd never heard of when I was in India. If I know anything about Indian cuisine, is that you can never have too much seasoning or too much sauce or too much flavor. Let's try it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like a milky tomato sauce. And it's got a little bit of heat. On my spice meter, it's like a 1.5. But for Minnesotans, it's like a 7. This could kill my grandma. And she's already dead. That's actually true. My mom doesn't watch the show. Don't worry, guys. <laughs> on State Fair Day 3, Calvin returned as we took on this fair's infamous stick food. From dogs to alligator. It's smiling, look. From a whole fried Snickers bar. It's so good. I'm going to make them. To a spaghetti dinner residing on a stick. What do you call a fake pasta? An impasta. Ah. Oh. Now, I'm returning to oodles of noodles. What I'm getting this time may not defy gravity, but it's still as daring a food feat as any. In a pan, add cheddar cheese, palm oil, and macaroni. Mix well and serve in a bowl. But wait, isn't that just mac and cheese? You ask in a dumb guy voice. Well, yes, it is. Except... They also add a load of Wisconsin cheese curds. This isn't your run-of-the-mill mac and cheese. My friends, this is a spectacle, a creation to die for. This is mac and cheese curds. Our final, final state fair food. Now this looks like mac and cheese, but mixed in are those cheese curds. Now, they're not fried cheese curds. These are raw... Raw? Naked, they're naked cheese curds. When I do a nice cheese pull, you can see the curds are kind of breaking apart, melting, they're gooey. I don't know how much more cheese a man's heart or body can take, but we're putting it to the limits today. We're gonna find out. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. That's over the top. This is satisfying on so many levels. First of all, as I dig around in here, I'm finding little bits of cheese curd. These are just little flavor pockets. I mean, the mac and cheese is already cheesy enough. It's over the top. It's like as melty and cheesy and creamy as it could be. Then on top of that, tons of cheese curds. Let's try one bite. Mmm. Oh. Oh, yes. It's everything that's good for you. It's carbohydrates, it's salt, it's cheese, it's oil, butter, fat, an extra stick of bread on the side. I'm not sure what for. Yeah, it's just bread. This right here is my jam. This makes me very happy. Can you see the stretchiness? Would you look at it? Are you looking at it? One more bite. Oh. 
Well done. A lot of people try to do cheese curds. Don't do that. Do your own thing or find a way to add cheese curds to your existing food. Huh? You have corn dogs? Add cheese curds. Corn on the cob? <laughs> cheese curds. Everything could use a little bit more cheese curds. The State Fair of Texas opened in 1886 as a livestock exposition. After over a century of bringing people together, it's now a world-renowned event, attracting over 2 million guests from all around the world with fun activities let it go, let it go. and even more fun foods. You can say goodbye to your waistline. Let it go. They're known for the classic fair foods you'd expect to see. That's very thick. Oh. But this is also the home of wild, out-of-the-box food innovations. That's why I'm here today. We're starting with their stunning but strange sandwiches. Calvin, <laughs> suck it. Welcome to the State Fair of Texas. Oh. Calvin and I are on a mission. Howdy. There you go. To uncover the five most bizarre, unique, inventive sandwiches at the State Fair of Texas. I'm looking for someone to think outside the box. Nay outside the bun. From hoagies incorporating breakfast cereal. When you take too much melatonin and you have insanely vivid lucid dreams, that's what this is. To giant red buns that really leave a mark. I've never had a sandwich that will literally change your skin color. In the end, we'll tell you which one gave us the most bang for, for our, our buck. Let's go eat. Let's go. Wait. Wait. Wait, actually? For real, Wayne? No. Let's go. Okay. Today's sandwich battle starts with the new kids on the State Fair block. Mississippi and your name. Who has the most S's? We do. Southside Steaks and Cakes. Mike Tyson would struggle saying that name. Southside Steaks and Cakes are making their debut at the State Fair of Texas this year. They've curated a menu full of dishes that don't follow any conventional cookbooks or recipes. It has a lot of soul behind the food. Their food comes from the heart, influenced by neighboring cultures as well as what they grew up with. They've got hood tacos. What part of it is hood? The hood stands for the culture, so we can reach the people that we reach out to the most. There's also Steak Chos, a collab between steak and Dorito chips. We kind of dance when we're doing it, bring passion to it. Calvin, you make tacos. Do you dance or do you remain motionless while you do it? Girl, you ready? <laughs> This is a very mm. good dance. Here we have something called a south side. And you know, it's a oh. nationally known oh. dance. Yeah, come on, get to it. Now for the first sandwich of the day. And this one is gonna get messy. We're getting the realest cheesesteak. This thing is absolutely stacked and packed. First, saute chicken and steak with onions and bell peppers. Then mix those two meats together. Add butter, a special homemade seasoning, and then three different cheeses on top. Three cheeses? Three cheeses. We've got yellow American, provolone, and pepper jack. On the side, mushrooms and banana peppers. Stuff all that inside a toasted French roll, topped with their secret Texas sauce. It's not a Philly cheesesteak, it's a cheesesteak done the Texas way. Calvin, do you know what it's time for? Party time. You gotta whip it up. Oh, we gotta whip. Yeah. Now you have to break it down. Oh, break, break, oh, 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 oh. Look at this sloppy, beautiful mess right here. Handle ability, not there. I tried to pick it up and the bottom broke out, but delicious ability on a 10. Well, you didn't try it yet. That's true. Okay, let's find out. Wow. The mixture between the chicken and the beef, they really meld well together. And that provolone cheese brings it all together. Oh, I love provolone. I love you too. There's a secret sauce in this that I'm not really understanding. It's kind of like a ranch chipotle mix, something mm. like that. That really brings in a different contrast to what usually is just a Philly cheesesteak. This makes it the Texas cheesesteak. I'm just gonna scoop the fillings. Screw the bread. I'm just going for the innards. It's just seasoned perfectly. The steak has a nice texture to it. The cheese is kind of gooey and gooey and combining all the other elements together. That, to me, my friend, is a damn good sandwich. Arriba, arriba, arriba. Is that something like Texans do? I saw it on a cartoon once, and he had a big Texas hat. And he ah. said, arriba, arriba, arriba. Is that still allowed? Round two, a sandwich that leaves a mark. Literally. This is Calvin. You can uh, fist bump him, maybe. That's probably good enough, okay. Fruteria Cano, a family-run Mexican food joint that's bringing the flavors of their 26-year-old restaurant here to the State Fair. We got tacos, flautas, we have a machete. I heard machete's like a, a knife. Machete is a long uh, quesadilla. 
why don't you just call it a quesadilla? It's shaped as a machete, so might as well put it in machete. They have no choice. You guys have been here since 2013. Has the menu been the same the whole time? No, we saw a need that we wanted a wow factor, and uh, Pambasa is one of them. Now, you grew up in California. There's a lot of Mexican food in California. Had you ever heard of a pambazo? Never. First, warm the bread up on the grill, then red it up with guajillo or dried chili sauce. On the side, grilled chorizo and potatoes. Is this something you eat at the breakfast time, lunch time, dinner time? In Mexico, you can eat it anytime. Throw that meat mixture onto the bread and add a week's worth of lettuce. Then to balance out the healthiness, sprinkle on a lot of cotija cheese. It's a very crumbly and salty cheese. Is it like a Parmesan? Imagine Parmesan in Mexico. Finally, top it with sour cream. Our faces are about to get very red very quickly. The chorizo is really savory. The potatoes, really nice crunch. But the star of the show, it has to be that bread. The bread is just so fluffy. It goes so well with these really heavy ingredients inside. It has a ton of flavor. It soaked up some of that heat. Ooh, and the cheese. The cheese is so sharp. It's tangy. I don't even want to know what my face looks like right now. It probably looks like I was boxing Mike Tyson. I love how this is traditional Mexican street food. You're walking through Mexico City, we're hanging out, and we're having bambazo. I've never had a sandwich that will literally change your skin color. Definitely a unique experience, one of a kind, and it will leave you with a mark, hopefully, for life. Next, a food stall kicking out sandwich innovations that are downright reckless. What's it called? Get fried. We've come here to get fried. Welcome to Get Fried. Honestly, you'd have to be a bit fried, either from heat stroke or some herbal enhancements in order to dream up this menu. Howdy. That's a little regressive. Howdy. Oh, all right. Howdy. There you go. Howdy. Okay, enough. We've got stuff like deep fried pickles and chicken in a pineapple bowl, but that's not even the best part. For this year's fair, they've created two new sandwiches that literally push the limits of what a sandwich can be. I'm talking about their chickeny Krispy Kreme creation, which we'll be trying soon. And then there's this, the Fruity Pebbles Po' Boy. The Po' Boy is made famous in New Orleans. And it's kind of like a banh mi. Here, you have kind of like a personal baguette, and then you're putting what inside? Deep fried shrimp that is battered in fruity pebble batter. <laughs> is that legal? It's Texas. Everything's bigger in Texas and better. First, they coat wild caught Gulf white shrimpies with their Cajun fruity pebbles batter. And you guessed it, it's time to get fried. Do they have the tails on? Yes. It's fried, honey. You'll be all right. Extra calcium, right? Now stuff the fried shrimpies inside a hoagie roll. Can we ask for a tailless? No. Can I have extra tails in my sandwich? Well, what are you? Finally, flavorize with ranch, sriracha, and Fruity Pebbles sauce. Then sprinkle on actual Fruity Pebbles cereal. This is the sweet, sugary cereal I ate as a kid, colliding with a New Orleans-style sandwich. I'm looking at it, I can see it exists for real, but should it exist? This is like when you take too much melatonin and then pass out and you have insanely vivid, lucid dreams. That's what this is. Somebody has brought this sandwich from the depths of their imagination to my hands right now. You can smell the sriracha, the ranch, and then the sweetness of the Fruity Pebbles. It's either gonna be just confusing and baffling to my palate, or it'll be just like this new revelation. Let's try just the shrimp to begin with. Mmm. Mmm. I thought this would be on the sweeter side. It's not that sweet. No, this shrimp has all the flavors packed into it. It has saltiness, spiciness. I shouldn't like it, but I do like it. You do? I do. I could have sworn your mmm was a fake mmm. Go play it back. Mmm. Mmm. It seemed so fake. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm gonna get that shrimp deep in there. You can see it still kind of cascading out the front. Let's give it a shot. Here we go. The fruitiness, it almost tastes like it could be lemongrass. No? Yes. <laughs> you don't think so? No, I don't. The shrimp on it by itself, it's really flavorful. And when I say flavorful, I mean a tad bit salty. But with the bread, it kind of balances it out together in that course of the ranch and the sriracha and more fruity pebbles. I really didn't think I would care for it. But as I eat more and more of it, it's growing on me. The fruity pebbles aren't even a major part of the experience. It's just more than anything, it's giving it a little bit of a crunch factor. Agreed. It's really pretty aesthetically. I want to dip my wife in fruity pebbles now, but she's already pretty. So, so unnecessary. But for me, this might win most creative today, but I'm not sure we need to go back and check with amanda for one more sandwich wow that was quite an experience but next is the chicken donut sandwich and it is phenomenal calvin can you guess the ingredients donut 
Mm -hmm. Chicken. Dude, nailed it. This sandwich begins with deep fried glazed Krispy Kreme donuts. That's twice this donut has gone through hell for our own gluttonous glory. Will this sandwich cause cardiac arrest? Um, I plead the fifth on that one. Deep fried, a pickle brined southern batter chicken breast. It's like chicken and waffles, but better. Way better. The build. It's not complicated. Deep fried donut, deep fried chicken, deep fried donut. This will either give my taste buds PTSD or put my heart in a state of paralysis. Let's find out. I love the whole sweet and savory combo. I wish more cuisines would do it. Like beef and pancakes. Bologna and cheese. Chicken and waffles. Like, um... Should we take a bite? We should. Oh my god! Dude, that is amazing! There's people right now will comment, oh, this is why Americans are bad. Do you know what we are? We're happy. This is delicious. Absolutely phenomenal. There's some kind of a beautiful crunch happening. Is that on the outside of the chicken? That is. That's a nice outer coating. Usually with chicken breast, I'm always scared that it won't be juicy. But this, this is juicy. Right here, you can see the donut has completely flattened out, hugging up against the chicken breast like a thruple. Like a what? When three people are in a relationship, they call it a thruple. I thought it polygamy. It can be called that too, but that's kind of been outlawed, and thruple is like a fun LA thing. Hey, we're all in a relationship together, and I hate my dad. This chicken breast has been brined in pickle juice. It gets this nice acidic brininess. Every time you take a bite, you like feel the sugary glaze squeeze out of the donuts and wrap around the chicken. I'm in love. So far, we've had four unforgettable food fantasies come to fruition, but now it's time to stop playing. Our last sandwich contender is a legend at this fair. He's the guy who invented fried butter. We're gonna try that in a different episode. Man, I wish you guys had fried meth. Who says we Abel? don't? Meet the fry god himself, although he prefers to go by Abel Gonzalez Jr. You might have seen him as a judge on Deep Fry Masters. Sometimes you overspice it and it just doesn't work. This deity, of all things delicious, has won awards left and right for the past 19 years for blessing us mere mortals with heaven-level fried innovations, like this fried lobster tail drizzled in champagne gravy. That is luxury. It is luxury at the state fair. But today's not about luxury. Instead, we're trying out their cult classic sandwich. Sandwich. This is gonna be our fifth sandwich today, but it'll be the best sandwich. Today you're having our very first big hit, the fried peanut butter, jelly, and banana sandwich. Let's make this happen. These basic ingredients are all able needs to create an award-winning state fair attraction. Ready? First, whip up a regular PB&J, spread peanut butter, and grape jelly on two slices of white ass bread. The next step is inspired by the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley. He would get a peanut butter and smash a banana in it and then fry it in butter. So oh. we just took that idea, fairified it, if you will, and brought it out here. Mash some fresh bananas and add that to the bread. Slap the two slices together, dip it in frying batter, then let it take a plunge in the good stuff. Does it also have bacon on it? Of course it has bacon on it. The final touches, grape jelly, powdered sugar, and bacon. Time to dine. Our fifth and final sandwich of the day. Are you prepared? I'm stoked. It reminds me of a Monte Cristo sandwich. A Monte Cristo is basically a sandwich that is buttered and fried. Buttered or battered? Buttered. Buttered? Is this battered? It's battered. Did they batter it with butter? I don't know, they did butter with batter. It would taste butter if they battered it with butter. Now there's a butter in the batter. I think there's butter in the batter plus peanut butter. It's gonna make it taste much butter. If there's butter in the batter with peanut butter in the and now we're done. <laughs> it doesn't even look like a sandwich. It looks like a fine work of art. Here we go. You ready? I'm ready. Let's go for it. <laughs> Powdered sugar will choke you every time. Ooh. On the outside, it's crispy. In the inside, it is just soft and pillowy. It's fluffy. Mm. Bacon and sweet things. They go together, like me and Calvin. Would you be bacon or am I bacon? I'll be bacon. Wait, then I'm jelly? No, you're sweet. Oh. Is that sweetness, it's that savoriness. But I like the texture on this one. It's really, really nice. I may never ever eat PB&J the same way ever again. I think what makes it beautiful is the simplicity of it. These are ingredients that everybody in the USA has in their household right now, except for the batter and except for maybe an industrial sized fryer. Mm -hmm. But somehow, when you take these simple ingredients and slap it together in the way he has here, and you coat it with the perfect batter, it just elevates it to a whole new level. That is awesome. Mm -hmm. This is gonna be a tough one. We have a big lineup today. The only thing we have to do from here, Calvin, is decide which one is the most creative and which one was the most delicious. Let's do that in a different location after a music break. The most creative sandwich today had to have been 
the Fruity Pebbles po' boy. Oh, I have to agree with you. Wasn't that crazy how they can take a very basic cereal but make it something completely extraordinary? Calvin, which sandwich did you find to be the most delicious? The most delicious sandwich I had was two donuts and the chicken. It doesn't make sense. How can something that has two ingredients be good? It was phenomenal. Yes, I love that one. For me, I gotta say most delicious, the fried peanut butter and jelly with B&B. Absolutely delicious. I love the idea behind it. I love Abel, he's an entrepreneur. And that's just day one of the State Fair of Texas. Today, I'm on the search for the most bizarre, strange food you'll find anywhere right here in the state of Texas. This is the State Fair of Texas, a breeding ground for daring culinary experimentation. It's like candy with beef in it. Am I gonna actually taste the beef? Of course including America's latest unhealthy, high-calorie obsession. You invented fried butter? I invented fried butter. No one's gonna contest this online. I dare them. Time to see which of these foods will become the next American staple. Let's go. At the State Fair of Texas, when you check out fair food menus, you'll sometimes notice these rare badges. That means these foods are contest winners, recognized as being the most delicious or creative by the Big Tex Choice Award. It works like this. Each year, there are 10 nominees and one winner in the categories of Best Savory Food, Best Sweet Food, and Most Creative Food. Here, Ruth has won four awards, including two just this year. Ruth, you ready? Yes. I want to give you a handshake, but I don't want to throw you off balance. We could stand here and shake all day. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, you're almost 88 years old. Yes. People who retire at 65, are they losers? Well, I wouldn't say oh, okay, that. I'm sorry. No, no. Her shop opened at this fair in 1988. Back then, she was specializing in tamales. Over time, her menu expanded, and so did her accolades. We made the finalists for the savory and the sweet. The brisket brittle is my sweet, crispy, crazy corn, the savory. And they both were finalists. They were both finalists. I want to talk about some of these menu items because I am so excited. The first thing I saw on your menu was the brisket brittle. Yes. Now, I've had peanut brittle, and I love peanut brittle, but what is a brisket brittle? Instead of the peanuts, add the brisket. Oh, flavorful. Oh, yes. Can you do that in anything? Could I do that with a Snickers bar? Take out the peanuts and put in brisket? Uh, peanut brittle. It's a hard candy, usually embedded with peanuts. Here, instead of peanut, they use Texas beef brisket. Am I going to actually taste the beef? Of course. <laughs> Peanut brittle, to me, it's like a Christmas confection. I'm here in Texas, and this brittle is filled with brisket. Hold on, is this brisket? Mmm, it's very brittle. Did I mention it's in a boot? I'm trying to find the most brisket piece. You can see little fossilized pieces of brisket inside. Mmm. It's sweet, it's crunchy, and then it's sticky after that. And the briskets release their own flavor crystal, filled with smokiness and barbecue-ness. I'm like Calvin now, just adding ness to the end of words where it doesn't make any sense. This is brilliant. I never would have thought to put these two together. They took a holiday treat and they Texasified it. This year, the brisket brittle was nominated for best sweet food. They were also nominated for this unusual take on the taco. <laughs> That's so state fair friendly. You can walk with the cone and you have a full meal. Okay, how many bites do you think that will take me? It's a pretty good meal. I have a pretty big mouth. <laughs> Ruth's taco cone starts with two scoops of cilantro rice placed deep inside the cone, then a plop of black beans. Layered on top of that, barbacoa, a type of slow cooked beef. Next, a scoop of pico de gallo, then a sprinkle of cheese, a lime wedge, and green jalapeno sauce. This is about kind of a bizarre food delivery. Usually, a taco is gonna be inside of a taco. When I was in Korea a while ago, I had a pizza cone, and it was just a very doughy cone that held all the pizza ingredients. But here, this is a taco cone. It's based off a hard shell. On top, they have a lime fritz. Nice. Mmm. Oh, the meat is so smoky and rich. This is delicious. You have to be careful because some of the wet taco ingredients will start rushing down. That's why they have that on there. But I wanted to show you. What? There's more layers. It just keeps going forever. We got some nice beans. A couple other things to note about the taco cone. This costs $18. That's not nothing. I might have to put a second mortgage on the house that I don't own at all, actually. But I gotta say, for $18, they're not skimping. This is legitimately heavy. It's super fun to eat, but you gotta be quick. If you wait too long, all those beautiful juices are gonna leak out the bottom. 
Fair experts here know some of the best food is hiding inside. This is our first time being indoors so far, and I like it because of the air conditioning. <laughs> yeah. Here in Texas. This food court has 27 different vendors, all with their own unique menus, so competition is fierce. You can't start with corn dogs, that's been here for 60 years, you can't have funnel cakes, pizza. But true heroes rise up and thrive in the face of adversity. Over time, hidden gems have come to reveal themselves. Chris, put her there. Hi. Meet Chris, owner of Scrumptious Pie Shakes. How long have you been here? 10 years. It took him four years of trying to be accepted as a vendor. When you apply, do you apply with like one food or a whole concept? You apply with a concept, but the concept has to be anchored in something unique. Our unique item in our restaurant is pie shakes. Make a shake out of a piece of pie. What do you put it in a blender? They put it in a blender. With ice cream? Yeah, exactly. I might need to get that too. Yeah, let's talk about the Texas Easter egg. This is what caught my eye and this is why we're here today. This was in the semifinals this year of the Big Tex Choice Award. For the savory category. That's correct. Okay. The Texas Easter egg. After looking at it, you may not be surprised to know this did not plop out of a bird or an Easter bunny for that matter. Texas Easter egg is essentially a deep fried jalapeno popper with a few extra things. Wow, and you fit all that inside. That's right. Instead, it's a blend of cream cheese, cheddar cheese, beef brisket, bacon, green chilies, jalapenos, and Tex-Mex seasoning. All that is formed into an oblong egg shape. Next, dip the egg in egg yolk, then coat it in a layer of breadcrumbs and Italian seasonings. The marketing is brilliant. This could have been anything. It could have been a cube. It could have been a rhombus. You chose the egg shape, and then you put kind of a pastel color on top. How'd you think of that part? I'm just a genius. Oh, okay. On the side, a drink. This is a shake that they put a whole pie into, and I was hoping to see the whole pie go into a blender, but they've blended it off premises, unfortunately. Oh, wow, it's so thick, like a Wendy's Frosty, but it tastes so much better. Oh, hi. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of caramel. It's creamy, it's chocolatey, which is odd because the color is like an off-white. That set me up perfectly for my savory treat right here. The ranch is so bright, pink, yellow, blue. I mean, this is what you would color an Easter egg with normally. It's kind of like a big meat. Oval. Oh, oh, I taste cream cheese, jalapeno, bacon, meat. Then there's just like this little bit of an exterior that's kind of crunchy. It's just holding everything together, like a thin breading. There's some strong ranch flavors in there too. Even more ranch. Remedies lost my darling. I think I overdid the ranch. It looks great, but that was a lot of ranch. It's one of the most unique foods I've ever seen. It's incredible that they've done this by hand. They take these kind of loose, creamy ingredients, bread them and fry them while making them pretty much look like eggs. I mean, it's kind of a messed up egg. Like if I was a chicken, I'd probably lay something like that. That'd be my best effort. Let's go. Our next strange food science lab came up with a menu item so good, it won two out of three categories in the same year. Another food vendor, another food. Check it out, guys. Check it out now. It was created by this guy. Tom Grace, the owner of Pizza and Funnel Cake Fingers, a 28-year-old business that started exclusively at the fair, but now operates as a catering company during the off-season. Their pretzel used to be their hot-selling item. Guys, that was until they invented this. This is one of the most unique foods I've ever seen, the Funnel Cake Bacon Queso Burger. Five words, one great food. It's a burger that contains a freshly grilled beef patty and crispy bacon. But instead of a typical bread bun, they make their own burger-sized funnel cake bun. Everybody loves funnel cake. Funnel cake is like a fair classic. It's fried dough and it's a dessert, but that's the funny thing. This has won an award for best savory food. So I don't know how they decided how to distinguish it. Is it sweet? Is it savory? It's a little bit of both. Next, the funnel cake, a burger patty, and the bacon are doused with queso. A liquid Tex-Mex cheese dip. Finally, sprinkle the whole thing with powdered sugar. I'm gonna pick it up. Okay. Yes, we have liftoff. <laughs> One pro tip from an amateur. If you breathe in while you're taking a bite, you will choke to death and die and rest in peace. I'm gonna squeeze it together so I can try to get my mouth around it. I see cheese, beef, bacon, and funnel cake in one bite. I'm going for it. Don't breathe in, don't breathe in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I dropped a little bit. 
Oh, Lordy. Mmm. There's so much happening right now. That bacon is juicy. Right here. One side powdered sugar, the other side queso. How's that make you feel? Conflicted? Not me. That's delicious. No, no. This costs $13. I've already dropped $3 of it. I need to be careful. Here's another good bite right here. Check this out. We got beef, bacon. We have the bun still intact. This is why I come to state fairs, for experiences like this. You're not gonna find this at a mainstream burger chain. They're gonna do a bunch of R&D. They're gonna find out that Frank from Oklahoma doesn't really like the crunch because it cuts the roof of his mouth, and then they're gonna change everything. But here, they don't care about Frank. Frank can go back to Oklahoma. We're in Texas. Our next unique food creation is something so unhealthy, I can't even believe it exists. I'm talking about fried butter. Abel? Yes. I'm back. Hey, welcome back, brother. I came here yesterday with Calvin, and we tried their famous PB&J. <laughs> Powdered sugar will choke you every time. Mm -hmm. Made and invented by Abel Gonzalez Jr., the owner of this here stand. Today, I'm on the search for the best and most bizarre foods. I'm talking fried butter. Fried butter. That's going to be my main course. I heard you also have fried... Coke. From Colombia? No, not that kind of Coke. Coca-Cola? Like Coca-Cola. Coke. How do you fry a liquid? It took me a little bit because, you know, I'm not the smartest person in the world. But you can't put a liquid inside a hot fryer or else you have some sort of an explosion. You get burnt a little bit. You've tried this before. I've tried it. I've trial and error. Here he starts with the dough mixed with Coke flavoring and Coke syrup. That dough gets deep fried and topped with whipped cream. Finally, cinnamon sugar and a wee slice of strawberry for a heavy hit of vitamin C. Here, diet no, <laughs> I almost said Diet Coke. I wish. Oh my God. What if you made this with Coke Zero? It would have zero calories. This is not that. This is fried Coke. This has been topped with whipped cream. They put a strawberry slice and I dropped it. Produce is very expensive this time of year. Oh. Abel. What? I don't know how he's doing this. This is some sorcery. This is blowing my mind. It's basically a bready bread, but there's something more special than that. There are some deep, fizzy Coca-Cola flavors inside. How is that possible? I don't know. I'm trying to deconstruct it and understand it, but it's bending my mind. I don't know how he did it. I mean, look inside. It just looks like bread. I don't even know where Coke gets its flavor from. I do believe they have Coke mines in Africa. It's very controversial, but that's not why we're even here. We're here for the unhealthiest food in America. I want to know, when you started out, what was the first menu item that you had that made you stand out? I was just, just trying to do everything that I could to make something stick, and pretty much nothing was sticking until fried PB&J, and then fried butter. I invented fried butter. You invented fried butter? I invented fried butter. No one's going to contest this online. I dare them. <laughs> you are losing your confidence. I know. And a little bit of sweat. A little bit. It has two ingredients, a butter cube and dough. The butter is placed in the center of the dough to form a dough ball that gets deep fried for just a few minutes. Top it with honey and cinnamon sugar and this heart-stopping buttery biscuit is ready to go. It's become like a state fair staple. You go to any fair, they're gonna have fried butter. So people are just copying what you did. It used to bother me, mm. but now fried butter is gonna outlive me. And that's pretty cool. I like it. Especially if you keep eating fried butter. <laughs> Ooh, sorry, <laughs> that was too honest. I'm sorry. That was, that was harsh. I know you're not supposed to wait too long. They give you four of them. It seems like a good deal for about eight bucks. Fried butter at the State Fair of Texas. Here we go. Oh, hot. Is the butter completely broken down and melted and like liquefied or is it? So when you bite into it, you're gonna squirt butter. Oh, mm-hmm. There's sugar on top, there's honey on top. There's a major sweetness factor, but inside that butter is bursting out in your mouth. Well, mainly in my mouth. Wait, is it in your mouth too? Mm-hmm, that was it, that was the moment. It gushed everywhere. That butter, you could dip crab legs into that butter. It was very hot, just hot enough. It didn't burn my mouth off. I still have all my taste buds intact. That is delicious. I don't know if you guys are butter fiends like me. I love butter, and it's gotten me into a little bit of trouble in my life here and there. I've gone to weddings where I publicly have been judged by how much butter I was putting on my dinner rolls, and I thought I was at a wedding and it was all free, and I didn't think it was that big of a deal. Here, this invention of his is gonna outlive him, and it's gonna outlive basically anybody who eats this type of food, for obvious reasons. On to the next location. Everything today has built up to this moment right here. I'm here to talk about your savory balls. All right. <laughs> Meet Greg. His parents, Norma and Robert Parrish, earned their booth here in 1985. 
Gourmet Royale, 99 years after the first fair took place in Dallas. It all started with popcorn. My dad opened the popcorn store, and over time, we just introduced unique items to the menu. But you guys have a lot more accolades than that. Yeah. Craig has a long ball history, starting with the fried chicken Alfredo balls that were nominated for an award but didn't win in 2019. Well, this year, he's bringing home gold twice. We won two awards for uh, most creative and best tasting savory for our deep fried seafood gumbo balls. Two of three awards, 66% right. of the total available awards. Right. Gumbo is a heavily seasoned stew famous in New Orleans. It combines several varieties of meat and seafood. I got to see it with the gumbo queen myself. Where's your recipe book? Oh, it's in there. Here, instead of the stew, he takes all the ingredients from the recipe, including rice, chicken, panko breadcrumbs, a homemade roux, shrimp, and andouille sausage. He mixes it all together and rolls it into a ball. How do you keep that bound together? With the combination of the rice, the roux, and the panko breadcrumbs. It creates an adhesive for the meat and everything to stick together. And from that point, you it, just throw it in the fryer? Well, no. No. Coat the ball with flour then an egg wash, then treat it in some panko breadcrumbs before frying. Has it helped? You yes. look very busy. Yes, business has been booming. Are you guys able to keep up? We've been prepared for it. Our goal was to have 100,000 gumbo balls made by the opening day. So we have been working very hard since July. Wow. Finally, a miniature cup of gumbo stew is served on the side. This is our final meal today. A bizarre food indeed, a stew that has been turned into a fried ball. As we tour the basket, we have some actual soup with the crab legs in it. Tabasco, that is not ketchup. Tabasco, saltines, because a lot of people like to put saltines in the soup. And then over here, we have fried okra. Huh? Oh, that is delicious. I don't know what seasonings they put on there. It's not just okra and breading. It's got some delicious flavors coming through. Here, a bit of gumbo. I've got a bay leaf still in the soup, and I'm gonna give this a little bit of a sip. Oh, wow. That's so rich, oily, and savory. Tastes like a little bit more like a condensed gumbo. <laughs> the first thing I notice about these balls is the heft. There's a lot of weight to them. Okay, these are not filled with air, like Lay's potato chips. I'm just gonna take a big bite and see what happens. Mmm, oh my god. It's very salty, it's very seasoned, and there's just so much meat in there. This is probably one of the most powerful balls I've ever held in my hands. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. I love the crust on the outside. It just gives it a little bit of a shell, and you can crunch through that. It's a really interesting, good idea. I think to be a winner, to be a standout at a fair, you have to have something that's a little bit familiar, but a little bit new. So they took something everybody knows and everybody loves, gumbo. And then they just kind of reconstructed it. They changed the configuration. I'm very proud of Greg. I love the story from the beginning to the end, from selling popcorn to selling over 100,000 of these balls in one month at this state fair. That's incredible. So that is the most strange, most bizarre, unique food I could find here at the State Fair of Texas. But for me, there can only be one most unique, strange, lovely creation in my heart. In fact, it's a creation that nearly stopped my heart, and that is fried butter. Fried butter knows how to take a perfect moment. Someone making fresh baked bread and putting on nice soft butter that's just barely melted. That really specific moment that you only get to experience a few hundred times in your life, they've narrowed it down to a special fair bite that you could purchase for only $8. Today I'm taking on the barbecue meat challenge at the State Fair of Texas. I'm taking down as many beautiful barbecue creations as humanly possible. Luckily, I'm not alone. Yo, great to finally meet you, man. Food reviewing veteran Mike Chen is by my side as we choose to eat or accept defeat. I don't know how many stomachs you have. This will throw you off. So who is going to give in first? Time to find out. When it comes to all the different animal parts, what is your absolute favorite? I love the belly. Like pork belly? Pork belly, beef belly, any belly. Is that a Texas thing? No, it's, I think it's an Asian think thing. It's we, Asian. Love, we love pork belly. I love you moved to Texas for Asian food. That was a big part of my consideration, but also best barbecue in the US. Absolutely, and today we're gonna eat until we drop. Are you ready? That sounds like the most marvelous day ever, buddy. Let's do it. But we, yeah, we have to keep going until we're not, we're not there yet. Cool. The State Fair of Texas is considered one of the best in America. It started way back in 1886, and now it has an attendance that rivals the Minnesota State Fair. 
I've seen their sandwiches. I've eaten their unique food creations. Now it's time for some barbecue. Mike, location one, food number one. This is a day of barbecue. So I wanted to start with something familiar because later it's going to get pretty crazy. Magnolia Beer Garden, a hidden gem at the State Fair of Texas. It's an ideal destination for beer connoisseurs and nothing goes better with beer than food. When you're doing your show, yeah. do you eat all the food? I try to eat all the food, but I may not always succeed because sometimes you have a 50 pound lobster. On the menu here, you can find their famous barbacoa tacos or celebrate the spooky season with this deep fried Halloween. Where did you find a 50 pound lobster? You go to lobster. Toronto and you get a 50 pound lobster. I think they made a lobster centipede and you thought it was one lobster. Maybe, but it looks like something that if it's crawling towards you, you should be running and throwing holy water at it. <laughs> All right, let's jump into this. This okay. is a pulled pork sandwich. Our breakfast starts with a warmed bun and a mount of juicy pulled pork topped with a tangy barbecue sauce. You ready for a big I'm bite? Ready. This is my first bite with Mike Chen. I'm excited. <laughs> this is wet. It is raining pork oil over here. I love that it's heavy, but the sweetness from the barbecue gives it a little bit of balance. And also, find pulled pork that's not dry actually is difficult. This is a good sandwich. Should we keep going? Yeah. This barbecue train is powering straight ahead. Now we're headed inside the food court to a booth called simply Stuffed Wings. Right here, we've got a $10 wing. Have you ever paid for one wing that cost $10? I have not. It's pricey, but you can see why. Look how huge this is. This booth was first established at this fair in 2015 after the owner had already built a successful Thai restaurant outside the fair. Would you believe it if I was like, yo, this was like a tiny rabbit or something like that, a tiny yeah, mouse. Absolutely. Here you can order garlic fries or delectable pork pot stickers. But the wings, these wings are like no wings you've seen before. Usually you can find something like this coming out of Southeast Asia, maybe Thailand. They're usually gonna stuff it with glass noodles and some other Asian spices. Here, they've kind of changed your recipe to suit the audience at the Texas State Fair. First, these wings go from bone in to boneless with a few precision Steven Seagal like arm breaks. I mean, I don't know what kind of stuffed wings you had before. This is crispy. Yeah, oh, it's super crispy on the outside. After deboning, the wings look like this. They're a bit limp, but she'll fix that soon. If this bird was on steroids and it flexed like this, oh, yeah, now the stuffing. Angel feeds the wings a mixture of spices, onions, cilantro, rice, and even more chicken. After the wings are looking plump and bloated, they're deep fried until the skin becomes irresistibly crispy. Oh, that's a beauty. I was half expecting juice to just fill my mouth and burn my tongue, which would have been 100% worth it. The rice and chicken inside could be its own dish. And the skin, that is so crunchy, but like thin and delicate. Oh, it's still steaming like crazy. We have kind of like a vinegar sauce here. Give it a little bit of a dip. I'm really happy with this. I mean, this will throw you off. What I love here is at the Texas State Fair, everybody's doing their best to recreate these common comfort foods of the USA. Then we have this Asian food stall where they just have taken a classic Asian recipe. They just tweaked it slightly and it's a perfect match. People should be eating this on Thanksgiving. Instead yeah. of uh, stove top. Stove top can go sit on the back burner and this shoving should take over. Oh yes, fiery statement. This is fantastic. A big winner for me. I like it too. Ferris Wheeler's Barbecue. These guys have been hosting a state fair theme at their own restaurant, including a 50-foot operational Ferris wheel. Yeehaw! There's a cruise ship coming through. We are on to our next food. We're outside and it is hot. It's hot, but this thing looks hotter. Their menu has unique items that still manage to hang with other fair food classics, like their creamy brisket mac and cheese or their sweet powdered sugar covered funnel fries. What kind of fries do you like the most? I like a thin, crunchy fry, but if these are crunchy, I'll like these too. I love, I love waffle fries. These are no ordinary waffle fries. This potato perfection is the foundation for their brisket waffle fry nachos. They shake the fries in a mixture of dry spices, salt, pepper, cayenne, paprika, garlic, onion powder, and more. Okay. You know why I love these rags? There's so many holes in them. There's so much crunch factor. Every single bite. I just spit out like five things saying that. It's all right. I'm tasting that too. Then to match our barbecue theme, they top it with a mountain of juicy smoked brisket, then the cheese sauce. <laughs> Lastly, add some fresh toppings and barbecue sauce. 
Here's what I found out. If you want to make something like a Texas a fine, you just add brisket to it. The other day I had like a peanut brittle, but they replaced the peanuts with brisket. That's Here, awesome. we have fried nachos with brisket on top. Yeah. All right, I'm going barehanded. All right. There we go. I got a nice juicy bite here. Let's go for it. That's awesome. These briskets, they're so smoky and rich. Texas brisket, basically people just, every day they get up and they research brisket. Mm -hmm. And that's how you make it so amazing. The only way you should try brisket in a different state is if they're claiming to do Southern style barbecue. If they're like, we have our own New York style brisket, run. Exactly. All right, boom, french fries, brisket. This is how you know you're in Texas. Like, All right, we gotta hurry up and get on board. <laughs> When people say bigger doesn't mean better, they're lying. And no one does food bigger than Dickel's Smokehouse. I think that's Dickel. Where's Dickel? So you're right. Can I look at him? But just do a quick glance and look like past him. That's Dickel. I think Dickel can hear us. Oh, no, he's, no, he can't. Open since 1980, their menu now features one of this fair's, no, one of this country's most oversized giant wings. We'll get back to those in a moment. First, a meaty morsel to whet our appetite. Here, he has a menu item with about 13 words in it. Uh -huh. It's called, uh... You remember this, right? Oh, we practice. Come on. Lollipop fried bacon wrapped sand sandwich? Smoked quail breast. This is a quail breast. Here, they wrap it in bacon and fry the whole thing. When I saw our foods, I first had a little panic attack because I saw more tomatoes on mine. Why do you have three tomatoes? <laughs> like, Why am I getting more vegetables? But we have the same. Same meat, the tomatoes, I don't even think they're for eating. That might be too healthy for us today. Yeah. Today's about the barbecue meat challenge. Yeah. What's the challenge? You guys have to watch all the way to the end of the video twice. Yeah. And if you could watch all the ads too, and then support our sponsor. Let's go for it. Yeah. Mmm. Now I know why he needs bacon. Mm. A little bit dry. Yeah. But imagine, that is one whole heck yeah. of a quail. We got some sauce here to lubricate it now. Let's try it out. Mmm. Mm-hmm. The jalapeno on side. Yeah, this is what you find out when you bite it in half. There's lots of stuff hidden in there that we didn't even know about. This is our appetizer. We're just building up Wait, to the main Wait, this is the appetizer? Yeah, yeah, there's another one. Turkey legs are very popular in many fair settings. You can get it at Disneyland, Disney World, the Minnesota State Fair. But this is a different turkey part. Can you guess which one? <laughs> This pterodactyl wing lookalike is less popular than giant turkey legs. But for the life of me, I couldn't tell you why. I don't know why these are more in common. Look at this thing. It looks awesome. Doesn't it look better than a turkey leg? It looks better. Preparation here is straightforward. Smoke the turkey wings until they turn this rich, dark shade of roasted perfection. I don't know about the wingspan, but I'm about to find out. I'm going to see if Whoa. it... Oh, well, how it's... much effort is that taking? Yeah, it's thick. Oh. Are you sure we can eat this? Good. Pretty good. Look at that wingspan right there. It looks like your elbow. Oh, oh is my arm? Your forearm, yeah. Yeah, just what? about. Look at this skin. Oh, it's gonna be a little rough. <laughs> That's very thick. And you can see the fat here. Yeah. This is still like big, thick chunks of unrendered fat. I do like the fat. That actually makes this taste more gelatinous -y texture. Oh my god. This is a workout. This upper part of the wing, it looks like a leg here. I got a nice piece. We've got some skin. We've got meat. Got a little fat there too. Oh, there is so much fat here. I am greasy. I could help a cow give birth right now. If you're going to help a cow give birth, you need to lube your arms up to your elbow. They just got to sh slide it up there. How do you know this? I've right. seen videos. I'll send you links. No, don't send me links. <laughs> No, I don't want those legs. I don't. That's good. I think the flavor is much better. It tastes like smoked turkey, not a ham at the Minnesota State Fair. For some reason, it's desirable to them for their turkey to taste like a pig. Some say turkeys drown when they look up into the ring. Is that right? I don't know Have you ever helped a turkey give birth? <laughs> Should we keep going? I'm learning a lot of stuff today. Our next stop, an icon at the State Fair of Texas. This is Fernie's. This place was started 50 years ago by John Winter and Wanda Fernie Winter. She was later labeled the queen of the state fair. These onion rings, you wanna try some? I do. This place built a legacy on funnel cakes, but we're here for something different. It starts with a side of onion rings made by the queen's daughter, Miss Erpio. Um. That's very satisfying. It's got really good flavor. Let's talk about this right here. For our main dish, the fried burnt end burrito. First of all, I was like, oh, burnt ends. What? So it's not brisket. Turns out burnt ends is brisket. Burnt ends. These delicious beefy morsels are not actually burnt, but they've turned black after smoking and developing a bark. Asian parents usually tell their kids if the meat is hard or burnt even a little bit, you can't eat it because it's poisonous. It's going to give you cancer, right? Yeah, that's my favorite thing yeah. to eat, though. These are the smoky, crunchy pieces that come from the ends of the brisket after it it's roasted for 12 to 14 hours. In Korea, someone will come by, take it off, and cut off all the little yeah, burnt parts like, for you. You can cut that off in my mouth. Right. 
I'm keeping it. The burnt ends are applied to a tortilla with a cream cheese, jalapeno, and bacon spread. Then two slices of pepper jack. Now wrap it and make sure it feels secure so it stays in one piece when it hits the deep fryer. Let's do the fresh, no touch bite. Okay, no sauce. Oh, hot. That's like the hottest, most passionate kiss we have with food today. The meat is smoky, it's tender and delicious. I like the texture. I want my alarm clock to be like the crunchy sound this thing makes when I bite into it. But then you get hungry every morning. They have this cream cheese inside. You need to balance it out with a little bit of sweetness here from the barbecue. Then, onion oh, ring. Oh, you are onto something spectacular, my friend. And then maybe a throw a pickle on that. You think throw you a, a pickle, pickle on, it? on that. This is the perfect bite. Let's go for it. I think we just helped them create something new. Also, I think the pickle is almost necessary. You know, that little acid? Yes. Balances that cheese out. Okay, let's wrap it up. Oh, maybe I'll do a little conclusion. We ate this food, let's go eat some more food. That's Nailed it. We've reached our final location and our final bout with some banging barbecue. Welcome to Hans Mueller Sausage. They've been here since 1972, cementing their place in the State Fair record books and winning some awards along the way. Oh yeah, you better disinfect. Yeah, I touch people. <laughs> Our appetizer, one of the finalists for this year's Big Tech's Choice Awards, the pork shot. I think it's, they mean shot as in like a one-shotter. Like oh, you okay, just, okay, okay, okay. You just shove it down. It's like taking a vitamin. This cheesy, meaty bite of goodness is formed by wrapping smoked bacon around a piece of sausage, creating not a meat ball, but a meat bowl, waiting to be filled with creamy mac and cheese, then sprinkled with spicy barbecue rub before heading to the oven. Talk about a party in your friggin' mouth. That is very salty. I don't think this is gonna leave my stomach for a long, long time. <laughs> I mean, it's gonna just sit there. It's solid. For me, I was like really looking forward to the mac and cheese aspect of this, but it just disappeared in a river of oil. That sausage is so oily. I'm pulling out the oh, sausage the for the sausage second sausage. one. I agree with you. Oh, I like that better. The bacon is good as bacon. The mac and cheese, it's not coming through at all. It makes me a little sad. I wanna praise this for a second. That smoky flavor came through. Yeah. This is today's final surprise, and I can't wait for Mike to see it. This ordinary looking ball is something special, created by Glenn Cusack in 2016. These are injectable great balls of barbecue. I think it's like a play on great balls of fire. Great ball of fire, yeah. After its debut, it became an instant hit. Now, there is something sticking out. The ball itself is made from shredded beef brisket that's formed into to a ball shape, then deep fried until it looks like this. Do you know what that is? It's a syringe. It's a syringe. Yeah. The best part, the flavor enhancing technology. This is like what I got my COVID shot with. I shouldn't be sitting next to you now. Here we go. Oh, and then here's the thing. You can get more. Suck oh. up more barbecue. Ooh. This is like a fun game now. Anyone can do about that? All right. We could go find a quiet corner where we could eat some balls. More drama. We're right in the middle of a scene right now. And then out there, they're playing music. You can't see it. It's all white. But this meat is hot, and Mike Chen is ready. Time to power through. How many syringes are we supposed to pump in? I think two. All right, let's go for it. Wow, it's almost like a mashed brisket. I think what they did really well is that the barbecue sauce is perfect with us. But you know what worked just as well as injecting it? What? This right here. Also very effective. You want to do something? Okay, hold on. What do you want to do? I want to inject like as much as you can into this thing until it overflows. So we're gonna make this thing overdose on overdose barbecue right now. Your brisket, like make it plump up. And you're gonna go in the same hole. Give it different holes. <laughs> All right. Oh, it's blooming oh, up. Yours is cracking. Don't let it crack, though. Okay. All right, ready? <laughs> Pop it. Oh, we're Pop it. The whole thing. Pop it. Oh. That's so much barbecue. And that is how you eat this. That was a flavor explosion. I think I overdosed myself. Congratulations, Woo. man. Now, this is the true Texas Fair experience. Thank you, well done. It's time to figure out which barbecue was our favorite. We're gonna talk about it next after this. Mike, Sonny, today we ate so many fun, new, innovative barbecue creations. I wanna know right now, which was your favorite? Top of my head. Stuffed chicken wings. First of all, skin is crispy. That's hard to do. Secondly, it's stuffed with more chicken and rice. It's like an Asian stuffing. Put this into your turkey next year. Are you being biased because you're choosing the only Asian thing we tried today? Maybe I am. And that's I'm okay. I'm okay with that. <laughs> For me, my favorite today, I have to go turkey wing. Okay. I've seen a lot of turkey legs around, yeah. but seeing a turkey wing, the scale of it, it was beautiful. It was full of meat. It was full of, it was full of grease and fat. Yeah, yeah. we talked I mean, about it already. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate this awesome day where a lot of new innovative 
innovative meat dishes were being had, so thank you. Absolutely, you're welcome. I paid for everything. Well, I offered. I didn't hear that. No, I did it not. It must have been very quiet. Boom, guys, that is the end of our video. I want to say a huge thank you to Mike Chen next to me for sacrificing his body to eat all this food. It was not healthy. Well, thank you so much for having me, my friend. Always been so much looking forward to this moment right here, so. And it happened. Day. Finally. Finally. Just a short 12-hour day at the fair. Guys, you can go follow Mike Chen on his YouTube channel right here, Strictly Dumpling. Otherwise, that is it for this video. I will see you next time. Thank you so much for watching. A peace. peace. A peace. A and then just put these fingers up. Oh, really? All right, got, I gotta go. I gotta go. I gotta, I'm gonna run a 5K.